When speaking earlier about the Hermetic tradition, we said that this properly refers to a knowledge that is not metaphysical, but only cosmological, understanding this last in both its macrocosmic and microcosmic senses. Although this was only the expression of the strict truth, it was unfortunately enough to displease some, who, viewing Hermeticism through their own fantasies, would like it to contain any and everything. It is true that such people hardly know what pure metaphysics is. However this may be, it must be understood that by saying that we in no way wish to depreciate the traditional sciences that belong to Hermeticism, nor those that correspond to them in the other doctrinal forms of the East or West, but one has to know how to put each thing in its place. And these sciences, like any specialized knowledge, remain secondary and derivative with respect to principles, of which they are only the application to a lower level of reality. Only those who would give the royal art preeminence over the sacerdotal art can claim the contrary, and perhaps this is at root the more or less conscious reason for the protestations just alluded to. We have considered this question in spiritual authority and temporal power. With regard to the expression royal art, which Freemasonry still uses, we may note here the curious resemblance between the names Hermes and Hiram. This does not mean that these two names share a common linguistic origin, but their composition is nonetheless identical. And the combination HRM, from which both are essentially formed, also suggests other comparisons. The Greek Hermes has in fact characteristics that correspond exactly to the sciences in question, and that are especially expressed by his chief emblem, the caduceus. This symbolism relates essentially and directly to what might be called human alchemy, that concerns possibilities of the subtle state, even if these are taken merely as the preparatory means to a higher realization, as the equivalent Hatha Yoga practices are in the Hindu tradition. As is said in the Rastil Juana Safa, the world is a great man and man is a little world. Jamin san kabir wal inson alamsi. This can be transferred to the cosmic order, since everything in man has its correspondence in the world, and inversely. Here again, and by reason of this very correspondence, the domain in question is the intermediary world, where forces are brought into play, whose dual nature is very clearly figured by the two serpents of the caduceus. We will also recall in this connection that Hermes is represented as the messenger of the gods and as their interpreter, that is, precisely, as an intermediary between the celestial and terrestrial worlds, and that he has in addition the function of a psychopomp, guide of the souls of the dead, which, in a lower order, is clearly related to the domain of subtle possibilities. Astrologically, the two functions of messenger of the gods and psychopomp can be respectively related to a diurnal and nocturnal aspect. On the other hand, the same correspondence can be found in them as between the ascending and descending currents, symbolized by the two serpents of the caduceus. It might be objected that in Hermeticism, Hermes takes the place of the Egyptian Thoth, with whom he was identified, and that Thoth properly represents wisdom, which relates to the priesthood as the guardian and transmitter of the tradition. That is true enough, but since this assimilation cannot have been made without some reason, it must be admitted that it is more particularly a certain aspect of Thoth that is considered here, one corresponding to a certain part of the tradition that includes the branches of knowledge relating to the intermediary world. And in fact, all that can be known of the ancient Egyptian civilization from its vestiges shows precisely that this kind of knowledge was much more developed there and had acquired more importance there than anywhere else. In India, the planet Mercury, or Hermes, is called Buddha, a name whose root means wisdom. Here again, it is enough to determine the order where this wisdom, which in its essence is the inspiring principle of all knowledge, is to find its more particular application when it is related to this specialized function. The name Buddha must not be confused with Buddha, the name of Shakyamuni, although both obviously have the same root meaning. Certain aspects of the planetary Buddha were later transferred to the historical Buddha, who is represented as having been illuminated by the irradiation of this star, whose essence he is said to have absorbed. Let us note here, 
that the mother of the Buddha is called Maya Devi, and that, for the Greeks and Romans, Maya was also the mother of Hermes, or Mercury. As concerns the name Buddha, it is curious to note that it is in fact identical to the Scandinavian Odin, Woden, or Wotan. It is thus not at all arbitrary that the Romans assimilated Odin to Mercury, and in some Germanic languages, the Day of Mercury, in French Mercredi, is still called the Day of Odin. What is perhaps even more remarkable is that this same name is found in the Wotan of the ancient traditions of Central America, who moreover has the attributes of Hermes, for he is Quetzalcoatl, the bird serpent, and the union of these two symbolic animals, corresponding respectively to air and fire, is also figured by the wings and the serpents of the caduceus. The serpent is opposed or associated with the bird according to whether it is envisaged in its malefic or benefic aspect. We will add that a figure like that of an eagle holding a serpent in its talons, which is to be found precisely in Mexico, does not evoke exclusively the idea of the antagonism represented in the Hindu tradition by the combat of Garuda against the Naga. On occasion, especially in heraldic symbolism, the serpent is replaced by a sword, a substitution that is all the more striking when the weapon in question has the form of a flaming sword, which can be linked to the lightning in the clutch of Jupiter's eagle. And the sword, in its highest signification, represents wisdom and the power of the word. It may be noted that one of the chief symbols of the Egyptian Thoth was the ibis, destroyer of reptiles, which on this basis became a symbol of Christ. But in the caduceus of Hermes, we have the serpent in its two contrary aspects, as in the figure of the medieval Amphisbena. One must indeed be blind not to see in such facts a sign of the fundamental unity of all traditional doctrines. Unfortunately, such blindness is only too common in our time, where those who truly know how to read symbols are now a tiny minority, and where we find, on the contrary, all too many profane ones, who think themselves qualified to interpret sacred science, which they fit to the measure of their own more or less confused imagination. Another no less interesting point is that in the Islamic tradition, the prophet Idris is identified both with Hermes and with Enoch. This double assimilation seems to indicate a continuity of tradition going back before the Egyptian priesthood, for this latter merely inherited what Enoch represented, and he manifestly relates to an earlier period. Should it not be concluded from this assimilation that the Book of Enoch, or at any rate what is known by this name, must be considered to be an integral part of the whole corpus of hermetic books. On the other hand, some also say that the prophet Idris is the same as the Buddha. What has already been said shows well enough how we are to understand this assertion, which really refers to Buddha, the Hindu equivalent of Hermes. It could not refer to the historic Buddha, whose death is a known fact, whereas Idris is expressly said to have been transported alive to heaven, which corresponds precisely to the biblical Enoch. At the same time, the sciences attributed to Idris and placed under his special influence are not the purely spiritual sciences, which are attributed to the prophet Isa, that is, to Christ, but the sciences that can be qualified as intermediary, among which alchemy and astrology belong in the first rank. These are indeed the sciences that can properly be called hermetic. But this brings us to another consideration which, at least at first glance, might seem to indicate a rather strange reversal of the usual correspondences. Among the principal prophets, a particular one, presides over each of the planetary heavens and is its pole, al Qutbah. Now it is not Idris who presides over the heaven of Mercury, but Isa or Jesus, whereas Idris presides over the heaven of the sun, and this naturally involves the same transposition in the astrological correspondences of the sciences that are respectively attributed to them. This raises a very complex question that for the moment we will confine to a few remarks which will perhaps enable us to glimpse the solution and will in any case at least show that there is something altogether different here from a simple confusion and which what might pass for such in the eyes of a superficial and outward observer is in reality based on very profound notions. First, this is not an isolated case among all the traditional doctrines, for one can find something similar in Hebrew angelology. Generally, Mikael is the angel of the sun, and Raphael is the angel of Mercury. 
but it sometimes happens that these roles are reversed. On the other hand, if Mikael, insofar as he represents the solar Metatron, is esoterically assimilated to Christ, Raphael, according to the meaning of his name, is the divine healer, while Christ also appears as spiritual healer and as restorer. One could find also other connections between Christ and the principle represented by Mercury among the planetary spheres. Perhaps it is here that one must see the origin of the error committed by those who consider the Buddha to be the ninth avatar of Vishnu. In reality, this is a manifestation related to the principle designated as the planetary Buddha. In this case, the solar Christ would properly be glorious Christ, that is, the tenth avatar, who is to come at the end of the cycle. We will recall as a curiosity that the month of May takes its name from Maya, Mercury's mother, who is said to be one of the Pleiades, to whom that month was formerly consecrated in ancient times. Now in Christianity, it has become the month of Mary by an assimilation, doubtless not merely phonetic, between Maria and Maya. If Hindu doctrine considers the Buddha as being the ninth avatar of Vishnu, that is the foreign avatar, this does not necessarily exclude other divine interventions that have taken place on behalf of foreign, non-Hindu peoples during the same period. In particular, Christ might be said to share with the Buddha the ninth avataric function, since his first coming was for the West, what the advent of the Buddha was for the Far East, and what the Quranic descent was for the Middle region. Now, as we have seen in connection with the Buddha, the ninth avatara is a mercurial manifestation. It would seem that the two comings of Christ may be related to his mercurial and solar aspects, the solar Christ being Christ glorious, that is, the tenth avatara, who is to come at the end of the cycle, the white horse of this final descent, being a solar symbol par excellence. It is true that for the Greeks, medicine was attributed to Apollo, that is, to the solar principle, and to his son Asclepius. But in the Hermetic books, Asclepius becomes the son of Hermes, and we should also note that the staff that is his emblem has close symbolic connections to the Caduceus. Around the staff of Asclepius is coiled a single serpent, which represents the benefic force, for the malefic force must disappear by the very fact that it is a question of the genius of medicine. Let us note, too, the connection of this same staff of Asclepius, as an emblem of healing, with the biblical symbol of the brazen serpent. This example from medicine, moreover, allows us to understand how one and the same science can have aspects related to different orders, thus with equally different correspondences, even if the outward effects obtained are apparently similar, for there is a purely spiritual or theurgic medicine, and there is also hermetic or spagyric medicine. This is directly related to the question we are presently considering. And perhaps we will explain someday why from the traditional point of view medicine was considered as essentially a sacerdotal science. On the other hand, there is nearly always a close connection made between Enoch, Idris, and Elijah, Dulkifal, both of whom were taken up to heaven without passing through corporeal death. It is said that they are to appear on earth again at the end of the cycle. They are the two witnesses mentioned in Revelations 11. And Islamic tradition places both in the solar sphere. Similarly, according to the Rosicrucian tradition, Elias Artista, who presides over the Hermetic great work, resides in the solar citadel, which is the abode of the immortals, in the sense of the Shirajivis of Hinduism, that is, beings endowed with longevity, whose life lasts throughout the whole cycle and which represents one of the aspects of the center of the world. He incarnates, as it were, the nature of the philosophic fire, and one knows that, according to the Bible narrative, the prophet Elijah was taken up to heaven on a chariot of fire. This is related to the fiery vehicle, Tajasa in the Hindu doctrine, which in the human being corresponds to the subtle state. Let us also recall from the alchemical point of view the correspondence between the sun and gold, which the Hindu tradition designates as mineral light. The aurum potabile of the Hermeticists is moreover the same as the draft of immortality, which is also called liquor of gold in Taoism. All of this is certainly worthy of reflection, and if one also adds the traditions, 
which nearly everywhere liken the sun itself symbolically to the fruit of the tree of life, one will perhaps understand the special relationship which the solar influence has with Hermeticism, insofar as this, like the lesser mysteries of antiquity, has as its essential aim the restoration of the human, primordial state. Is this not the solar citadel of the Rosicrucians, which is to descend from heaven to earth, at the end of the cycle, in the form of the heavenly Jerusalem? Realizing the squaring of the circle, according to the perfect measure of the golden reed,